applications, right? So just wearing a helmet which is connected with an EEG machines and by understanding the pattern of your brain and you can drive a car, right? Or you can do a, some other applications as well, right? So how we are going to analyze EEG and how we are going to analyze biometrics, that's the next thing, right? Right, so why, do sh why should I integrate all these things, right? Why should I integrate all this, right? Okay, fingerprints you might have heard is a unique stuff of all the humans. So they are almost, we have uh, 8 billion of humans, uh, but still we have a unique fingerprint, right? And do you know there is a digital fingerprint for all your systems? Do you know that? Digital fingerprint, do you know what is digital fingerprint? No, okay, every browser that you use, whether it's uh, Chrome or whether you are using uh, Edge or whether you are using Safari, whatever the browser it is, every in browser has its own fingerprint. That's a unique. Your browser will have a unique fingerprint and that fingerprint will be uh, periodically changed, right? So you might have under, uh, wondered, like how do these ad companies are tracking the history, right? We don't use cookies. Cookies, you might have aware of this, right? We are storing information in cookies for the later purpose, right? But ad company is not using the cookies. What we are using is your fingerprint. For every website you visit, right? For every web website you visit, we collect your fingerprint. And then with that fingerprint, we can able to, uh, uh, we can identify who you are, which device you are using, what is your browser, what is your mobile device, which time zone, which country, which location, and in fact, you can identify which, what is your IP address. So based on all these informations, we are giving you, our view, we are generally, what we are doing is, we are showing your personalized ad. That's why you can see the same uh, products, if you search something in Flipkart and Amazon, and you are seeing in some other website, because of, based on the cookies and fingerprint, and this fingerprint is unique, all your fingerprints will be, whether you are using incognito or normal mode, your fingerprint will be recorded, right? So that's a digital fingerprint like that. That is a unique, same like this, right? So integrating with this uh, digital uh, fingerprints, biometrics and EEG, we can have a better security because these are unique. No one can uh, misuse that or no one can unauthorize that particular uh, stuff. Right? And then it's very uh, convenient, right? Instead of, you know, imagine, right, instead of entering the, I mean, earlier we used to enter, the, we, we, we used to draw the pattern over in the Android phone, right? Now it's very simple. Just to, you, you take your phone, it will automatically unlock based on your face, right? It's very convenient and then it's very secure, right? It's very secure. So that's the main advantage of using biometrics and then digital forensic stuff with the technologies. Okay, and you are already aware of what is biometrics, right? So there are different types of biometrics. One is uh, psychological and other one is behavior, right? So the psychological is, is what your fingerprint, hand, face, retina, that uh, iris detection, and then uh, we have a DNA stuff. So these are all unique, 99.99 percentage, these are all unique, right? We accept face, so face may have a resemblance, right? But apart from this, everything is a unique. So that's a psychological biometric, right? We are familiar with this, right? Because a couple of we are already using face recognition and then uh, fingerprint, and then you might have uh, seen uh, the iris scanner in all the movies. Right? The other one is the behavioral, is the signature, right? And then your EEG. So EEG is a one of your behavioral. Uh, biometrics because based on your behavior, your EEG will change, right? So we'll talk about that. And then we have a keystroke, the way you perform. Is that like there is a uh, uh, Parkinson disease, is a behavioral uh, stuff. It will affect your behavior, the way you write, the way you talk, the way you walk. So it's kind of certain things will get affected if you get a Parkinson disease, right? That's a kind of behavioral attack, right? So we are mainly concerning about the psychological stuff because all the applications are already having this psychological stuff with the, uh, this is the I mean the applications, right? Okay. So how we are doing, so how we are identifying your fingerprint, how we are detecting the fingerprints, what is the uh, basic underlying technology behind this? We have two 
uh, basic approach uh, to identify whether it's a face or it's a fingerprint. Right? We have a two basic uh, approach. One is feature extraction and feature matching. Okay? Feature extraction and feature matching is a old technology, but it's very uh, fast compared to other stuff. It's a cheap and in, I mean it's a inexpensive. Uh, it's, it does not consume more time and then it's pretty much faster than the other approach. But that's other uh, way around for everything. So the negative side of this feature matching is accuracy. It is not that much accuracy. Okay. So in feature matching what we do is, I mean feature selection or extraction and feature matching is, we compare one to one. We compare one to one. We select node points or we can select some um, points from the data. So you can see in the second one you can see there are uh, uh, dots with the encircled in uh, uh, different colors, right? You can see that, right? So that is a features. So these are the feature points, right? Or we can, in a, a simple term, we can tell that as a landmarks. We can tell that as a landmarks. So what we do is we collect these landmarks from all across the data, and then we compare with the known stuff, right? Assume that the right and the last most, uh, the uh, what's <coughs> the rightmost one is the from the database, right? And the first leftmost one is the uh, test data, right? So what do we do is we collect a few landmark points from the test data and then we compare with the two uh, landmarks, right? And okay, let me put it this way. Have you, have you used image processing in any of your courses? Have you studied? Okay. Have you tried this? Have you taken two different, uh, two similar image and then have you just subtracted that? Have you tried that? Yes or no? Okay. If you take two similar approach, so two similar image, and you, if you subtract these two image, what do you get? What do you get? You get a black image. Okay. You get a black image because these are two identical image. Okay. To understand the image again, so what is image? What is image? So image is a matrix, okay, image is a matrix, it has numbers, but instead of for each in a matrix, let us assume that you have an image, uh, phi cross phi, okay, how do you depress an image with a pixel, right? So what is the pixel? It is a number of pixels in the image. So how, what is the HD image size, HD image, 720 cross 420, somewhere around, that is a HD image which means there are 720 cross 480 pixels in the image. Each pixel is nothing but RGB value, it has three elements, okay. So if it is a color image, you get three values in each pixel. If it is a, a grayscale image, that is a black and white image, you will get only one values. So image is a nothing but a matrix. If you load image using Python or MATLAB, whatever the language, and if you print that variable, you see a matrix. If you load color image, and then if you print the color image, and you see a matrix in each element has a three values, R, G, B, okay. And each value, this R, G, B are the primary digital colors. These are the primary digital colors. There are three, two different primary colors. One is for digital and other one is print media. For the digital, the primary color is R, G, B. What is it for the print? Cyan, magenta and yellow. That is why you see all the newspaper and your printer are having these colors because these are the print basic colors. So R, G, B, these are the digital primary colors and each color varies from 0 to 255. That is the intensity. R varies from 0 to 255 and green same for where 0 is nothing but, 0, 0 is nothing but black. 255, 255, 255 is nothing but white because it is the highest intensity, right? So now, if you take a color image and two identical image and if you subtract and you will get a black image, you should get only 0, 0, 0, 0 is the resultant matrix and that is how we can say so these two images are similar, right? So earlier we, there was a system to identify the persons, right? If there is a person 
in the room, then it will detect the, and then it will identify, uh, rise the alarm, right? Have you heard about that? In all the uh, movie, old movies, you have this technology. Someone comes into a uh, closed shop, it will identify that person and then uh, trigger an alarm because they are what they are doing is they are subtracting the image, right? If the one image with the closed room and one image with the person in that room will give, a, will it, it will not give you black image, right? It gives some object or some other color. And that's how they identify. That's a kind of feature matching, right? So here what we are doing is we are extracting the nodes instead of taking the entire uh, data, instead of taking the entire image and doing a subtraction. What we are doing is we are selecting most important points from the image, right? And then what we are doing is we are, instead of subtraction, what we are doing is we are doing a vector distance calculations. What you are doing is a vector distance calculation. You might have studied like uh, norm distance or unit vector kind of stuff, right? Okay, so very basic and important concept in uh, machine learning is norm distance, right? N-O-R-M, norm distance. Or you might have heard about this term, Euclidean distance. Have you heard about this term, Euclidean? Yes. So, Euclidean is a one of the norm distance approach. Right? There are lots of other variation to calculate norm distance, but highly widely used approach is Euclidean distance. So, what we do is, we take the same vector points from the known fingerprints and we take the vector points from the test fingerprint and then we calculate Euclidean distance between two points. Right? If the equality and distance is 0, then they are close to each other. If it is not 0 or somewhere close to 1, then these two fingerprints are completely unmatched. You understand? So, this is a very simple feature extraction and feature matching. So, we are do, using two things. One is feature selection. Right? What do we do is, uh, we take random points or not a random points. We take points from a uh, fingerprint image, right? And then we do a equally distance calculation with the test image and the known images. If the equally distance is zero, then these two are same. If it is not zero, then these two are completely different. Okay, right? Do you understand? Right? Uh, fine. So this is a one approach, right? Well, we were doing this approach or maybe before 2010, or I can say this, uh, till 2016 and 17, uh, we were doing this kind of approach in the facial recognition, in the fingerprints, and all the stuff that were, uh, that were in the market before 2016 and 2017, they were following this particular approach, feature selection and feature matching, right? So, in the uh, world of machine learning, so you can see uh, the change in machine learning every three years. Right. So, before 2016 and 17, uh, if, if, if you uh, go somewhere and if you talk about machine learning before 2015, no one would understand that. Right. So, I was there in that era. So, I was there in the 2015 time. Whenever I was talking about machine learning, it was calm. So, no one understood anything. Then after 2016, the Google, right, it started acquiring lots and lots of companies which are doing something based on AI. Right? So, Google acquired more number of companies in 2016 and 2017 just because they have a, some basic AI stuff. And then systems changed and then everyone started doing about the machine learning. And then again the system, the cycle changed now after 2022 December, after releasing a chat GPT. Right? Okay. So, post 2017 and 2016, the second approach started implementing for this kind of approach which is a machine learning approach, right? So, what do we do is, we take some machine learning algorithm and we feed the algorithm with the data, as I said earlier, right? And we train the system, right? It should understand how each person's fingerprint is or how the fingerprint is vary for uh, different persons. It will understand entire features. Instead of extracting certain points from the fingerprint, it understood the entire stuff. For example, the curves. Uh, intensity, right? There are different types of fingerprints. If you have understood that, if you are, I think there is a movie with that, right? So, the, in that movie, they explain what are the different types of fingerprints, right? There are three to four types of fingerprints, right? So, the machine learning algorithm will understand all these informations and then it will get trained, right? That's the first thing. 
and then whenever you give the test image it will um, it will have the capability to identify whose in fingerprint is that that is a second approach that is a machine learning based and we have a different algorithms we have a different uh, approach for the machine learning maybe you will understand uh, maybe on the in the upcoming sessions right so this second approach is giving you a better accuracy uh, you can get almost 99 percentage of accuracy if you are going with the machine learning or neural network based approach right but the cost for this is too high because you need a dedicated system you need to have a uh, that it's a time consuming and expensive but that this uh, positive side you will get a literally better result than all the previous that's a second approach for the biometric this is how uh, your face recognition is working and your fingerprint is working and all the biometric systems are working so when you give uh, when you buy, when whenever you uh, register your face in your mobile what you do is you give a mob, uh, face in different directions right that how it works right in android as well so you give different your face in different directions and uh, and it takes a couple of uh, rounds right turn this side turn that side means you are giving a data to train the system right so the system will get trained with your face so whenever you come next time it will identify you are the real owner if uh, someone else is using your phone it will not uh, uh, you know accept the space because it's not the trained face right so even you can have a phone with multiple face register so it's a kind of training so for every new person you have to undergo this particular step so you are going for you are doing a training and all this right and lots of mobile companies are come, giving an advertisement like ai processor right so the processor is having ai processor the, which means that processor is dedicated to a certain ai uh, applications for example some more a lot of uh, mobile phones are coming with camera with more features right so that features are that processing are taken care by that particular process it's a dedicated process so now nowadays we are following the second approach machine learning based approach uh, even too precise neural network based approach right it's expensive but still you get a better accuracy okay you already know about the real time applications right so your mobile phones and your there are biometric systems for i think for the faculties they have biometric systems at the entrance and uh, even your mobile phones have two different features fingerprint as well as camera front and uh, face and then uh, uh, have you heard about this i don't i'm not sure about there was a uh, there is a system to identify the thief in the highly populated dense area right so in the uh, t nagar have you heard about the t nagar chennai yes so it's a it's a, it's a single main st uh, streets will be there where you can see always 365 days you see a crowds right so there are lots and lots of crowds at the same time there is a lots of opportunity to do a snake, uh, chain snatching and all the illegal stuff to identify that or to prevent that uh, chennai police it's a long back um, so they installed a system which is have an inbuilt face recognition system and that system is trained with all the known thieves right all the no, known uh, pickers right so and whenever this system will do a 360 degree scan across the street uh, to a certain range obviously so if they if that system finds a particular person then it alerts the nearby uh, patrol or beat right? so this is a system was uh, was there in uh, chennai tnagar and it, i think it's there in almost um, so many other places right so this is a one of the real time applications to identify or to prevent the uh, crimes and there is no retina scanning stuff in India as far as I know. Uh, as as I never heard about anything, something working on retina scanning or authentication based on the retina, right? It's still in the, uh, maybe you can see that in the movies and all these things, but I never uh, come across anything, something like that uh, because it's, it's very, very difficult other than your other, I guess only in other you have this your retina scan and we don't use that. Right? at the time of registering you uh, you might have you are retina might have scanned right after that we generally use our fingerprint and otp right so retina scanning is there but retina based authentications we don't have because of the uh, cost i guess right 
Okay, so now you know what is biometrics and how the biometric identifications are working and basic about the concepts and how do I implement this. So, if I want to uh, do some uh, hands on how do I do it, what is the easiest way? So, the easiest to programming language as far as I know is Python, right. So, to learn Python you need just a 15 hours, they assume that you do not know anything about Python and you have a 15 hours, dedicated 15 hours and you can learn Python easily. From 0 to intermediate level, uh, 15 hours is very, very easy. And the other advantage of using a, learning a Python is you do not need to do everything from scratch. Instead, you can use the libraries. Have you heard about the libraries? I think you might have, have some knowledge about Python and libraries, right? Right? Yes or no? Everyone? Okay. So, and this is a TensorFlow is a Google's library, right? And it is a widely used the, uh, library for machine learning as well as neural network, right? With this libraries, you can do a lots and lots of applications. You can create any application. Right. And there is one application, have you heard about that open CV? Yes? Yes or no? I need an answer from everyone. Yes or no? Okay. So, open CV is, okay. So, every time I ask this question, so that if I get major uh, yes as a sound, so I skip. If not, I will explain. That is why I am asking answer from everyone. Okay. Open CV is the first image processing library, right? You, with this library, you can do lots of image processing stuff, right? Even this OpenCV has a, some certain inbuilt uh, functions to do a face recognitions and then uh, uh, like eye detection, face detection, face recognition stuff also it has. So, OpenCV is for image processing. If you are interested in image processing, right? So, you want to do some research or you want to expel yourself in image processing, then two things you should know. One is this OpenCV library and the advantage of this library, uh, it has two stuff. One, it, you can use it in C++ as well if you are good in C++ or Python. So, I generally use in Python, right. So, it has lots of functions and have, it has a good documentation. So, you need to understand this OpenCV. With this single library, you can do lots of image processing stuff. That is the first thing and second thing, if you want to become an image processing expert, you should learn. Uh, digital image processing, uh, there is a one uh, familiar book for this, the digital image processing books by Gonzales, right. The author name is Gonzales. So, he is a, uh, that book is really good to read and if you want to become an expert in image processing, you need to understand these two, OpenCV library and then digital image processing. And TensorFlow, obviously, you have a lots and lots of internet videos, blogs and you can literally find almost hundreds and thousands of uh, YouTube videos and then uh, blogs for, uh, for using and how to use TensorFlow, how to create something using TensorFlow. But before you do anything, always read the documentation, which is very important, right. So, these are the mainly used libraries for biometric identification. So, anything, it can be image, face or whatever. I think you have one uh, session with the face recognition system, I am not sure. He, may, he can also may use the same TensorFlow library. The next one is about EEG. So, you know what is EEG, right? As I said, um, EEG has a different, uh, I mean the brain waves have a different stuff, alpha waves, beta and gamma and each wave is representing certain things. That is why I said whenever you hear certain Ile Raja song, you feel like uh, sleeping, you feel like uh, crying, you feel like uh, dancing, right, because it is stimulating certain waves, right. So, if you have an habit of doing a meditations, the meditations will go in certain places, right. So, you can see uh, the wave and their uh, stuff. So, their waves and their stuff, the responsibility of each waves, right. So, if it is a deep sleep, the delta waves, whenever you are in the deep sleep mode, uh, hardly you will go deep sleep into 4 a.m. So, where your uh, brain will be in the delta waves and whenever you do a, a, a meditations, you are triggering an alpha waves and which is a very good for visualization. So, if you are interested in meditation and all these things, you will understand how alpha waves is. So, anyway, back to this content. So, EEG is having a different wave pattern for different purpose, okay. 
and this is our data. The different wave pattern is our data. So, we are going to collect this data and we are going to understand, analyze this data. Have you seen the EEG, right? It is like something like a sinusoidal waves and you can see that the uh, differences between each waves. And we are using this wave and this information to understand different aspects of a human, right? Okay. So, unlike a biometric processing, image uh, EEG processing is not easy. Right? Biometric processing is so easy that you can easily do with a couple of libraries, whereas this uh, fellow EEG data processing is tedious because you have one big uh, block here which is artifact removal and filtering. Right? EEG signal may come up with the noise, it is based on the node they are placing and if there is a problem with the node, if there is a space gap between the node and the skull, you get a noise and there is always, um, so EEG is always come up with a noise. So, you need to remove that noise, you need to handle this artifact, right. So, that is a tedious process, right. But once you have done that particular block, then you have a good flow, right. You can send that filtered EEG signal to a machine learning model and with that model you can able to, I mean you can uh, create a system that uh, will have a capability to do a lot of things, okay. For this library, uh, this I mean for this EEG that we can do M and E. So, M and E is the only library that Python has for EEG and MEG, right. It can, uh, it can be used for two different uh, sources, one is EEG source and MEG source. EEG means electro uh, stuff and MEG is magneto stuff, like magnetic waves and this one is the electric waves, right, uh, electric fields kind of that, right. And uh, if you again, uh, same, if, if you are interested in EEG analysis and EEG, then you have a lots of use cases to be solved and uh, if you are, you need to have some domain expert. Domain expert in the sense you need to understand the components in the EEG and uh, the some medical terms you should understand. But if you can solve that, if you can understand those uh, medical terms and you can have a uh, lots of use cases too. Okay, so first one is the lie detector. The first one is lie detector. You might have heard about that, and there are lots and lots of YouTube videos about lie detector, like they wear some helmet. And they, you, the doctor will ask questions. Based on the person's response, the monitor will go different stuff, right? So whenever you uh, be a tell, uh, whenever you are telling a lie, your brain will function in a different way. Whenever you are telling a truth, your brain will function in a different way. Based on that behavior change, the system will identify whether you are telling lie or not. It's very pretty much uh, obvious stuff that we know already. The second one is the cognitive state analysis. Right, the cognitive state analysis is nothing but is understanding your mind, understanding your thinking capability, right. So, it is very simple for a single question, different people think in a different way, right. So, to understand that, we are using this cognitive state analysis. So, cognitive state analysis will tell you which mood you are in, what is your, how your brain is functioning and what is your brain is thinking about like the wave patterns and everything can be analyzed with the cognitive state. The other one is same, the investing period is then, so the investigating stuff is nothing but analyzing uh, what you, how you are reacting in the investigation stuff, whenever a user is having some interrogation, uh, how the brain is doing some behavioral change. So now you know what is EEG and how what can be done with all these things, biometrics and EEG. And what is the challenge here? What is the future and what is the problem with all these things? That is obviously, right? If you find if whatever thing we take, there is two side, one is good and bad. What is the bad thing about this and what is the future uh, development for this and the challenges we have? Okay. So challenges is very first, is a very uh, most important stuff is that data. Quality. As I said, EEG always comes with noise. That's the one thing. The second thing is this 
is you need to have a filter. Have you studied DSP? So you have a high pass, low pass band filter, right? So you need to do all the filtering stuff to remove the noise from that. But if you remove data from that signal by assuming the data as a noise, then you are losing information. With that uh, partial information, you cannot create a system to predict something uh, in a good, uh, with accurate results, right? So data comes with the noise and removal of noise is a tedious process because that's what I said in the previous slide. The next one is the scalability, right? So the first thing that we decide, okay, in a company, in an industry, whenever we discuss about an application, whenever we discuss about the star, um, software, we think about two things. One is <coughs> traffic, how to handle the traffic. The second one is scalability. Scalability is nothing but if you have a 10 members, EEG data, no issues. If you have a hundred members EEG data, it's no issues. What if you have a hundred thousand EEG data? What is if you have some <coughs> millions of persons EEG data? So storing that and then processing that number of data, you need more complex system and you need highly computational capability system for all these things, which is a quite expensive. So scalability is a still issue. Again, you need to spend a lot of money on that. The second one is user acceptance, right? If someone tells EEG data cannot be created synthetically, right? So whereas other data can be created synthetically, but EEG data cannot be created synthetically to get a more accurate information, right? So to, for that, you need some user consent to accept that. Users should accept to use their EEG data to use as a research purpose, like how we are giving a permission on our mobile phones. Since maybe India, uh, the country like India, right? We may give permissions to everything for everyone to access our stuff. Whereas apart from India, the people outside India are so, so concerned about their uh, privacy. So they don't easily share their information. So important so to follow the, all those compliance, right? So that's a challenges in the integrating with bio uh, metrics and then EEG data. The ethical issues, very simple is a misuse. So people can misuse all this information because if some, if you have a fingerprint of someone, you can do some hacking stuff. But if you have a, someone's EEG data, then you can do certain things, right? Okay, biometric, retina scan, fingerprint, that can be easily reused. But how do someone, how could someone re misuse EEG data? Do you have any idea? The EEG is a graph, the nothing but a graph. And what do they do with that EEG graph? So EEG data is having an uh, information about how a particular person is thinking. What is the, uh, their capability, how their brain is reacting for everything. If we can alter that information, then we can change certain cases. Right? So maybe I can, these are the things that we can do with the, uh, by misusing, we can do by misusing the EEG data. The last, last one you can see is a false treatment, right? If you altered EEG data of someone, which will result, them, yeah, result in false treatment for that, that may go up to uh, you know, <clears throat> a treatment and the person loss and all this thing. And then if you understand how a particular person is thinking, then you can manipulate that person, right? If you know how, how do I think, right? If you know how do I think, if you know how do I answer for a certain questions, you can easily ask me whatever you want, right? Because you know the pattern, right? That's what the misusing of EEG data. Someone can, um, you know, use a misuse it. I mean, if you, someone can manipulate EEG data, they can achieve whatever they want from the other person. Okay, so what is the future of this? Right? What is the future of this? Is a multi modeling system. Right now, we have a single modeling system, whether it's a fingerprint or a facial recognition or something like that. But in future, we can have a multi modeling system, which means we can combine multiple uh, biometrics, we can combine multiple things. As I said, based on your brain's function, you can let your car or certain things to drive. Right? So, there is, uh, I think you might have seen this in a video, uh, this bio arm, right? Bio arm is integrated with your brain, 
so that based on how you think the bio arm will react. So right now we have a bio leg and bio uh, arm, but that will not do anything like a human leg, right? Human hands are human leg. So these bio arms integrated with the uh, EEG and other uh, data, uh, it can function like a real human stuff. So these are the future development or something is in uh, research. Okay. So I was planned to show some demo uh, about uh, the fingerprint analysis and couple of other things, but out of time, I have to skip it. These are the things that I, I use, I uh, plan to show as a demo uh, since I was planning for some speech recognition and then uh, fingerprint identification. But I could share the course with your, uh, uh, you know, whoever the in charge of this. So you can just get the code along with this deck, right? So along with this deck, you can get the code from your uh, faculty so that you can try it on your own, right? So it's a simple or you can easily get it from the Google as well um, if you understand the code or I, I, anyway, I will share that. Okay. So it's almost um, come to an end. The ways that you can connect with me, uh, if you are interested to connect with me in, uh, in future for any of your uh, stuff, for your research or your job. So these are the ways. My website, uh, sharmasaronan.com is my personal website. Uh, you can connect me on my website. Second one is uh, LinkedIn. So I highly active on the LinkedIn. You, you, the only way you can easily access, um, you know, access me is a uh, it's a LinkedIn where I share lots of posts about the technology and uh, recruitment, jobs, internship, everything. So we can use that. So in LinkedIn, you can just Google it, Sharma Saravan. I mean, you can search for Sharma Saravan. So get my third one is my company websites, Best Science Technology, which is science dot okay. uh, You can also uh, post your queries on the uh, bot that have. Right. Sharmasaranan.com is my website and Sharmasaranan is on the LinkedIn and then you can also check it out the website of company based on the next one I write a blog I, I write a blog about uh, technology uh, learning and all these things on medium again you can just find it on <coughs> medium.com by searching Sharmasaranan finally and uh, on LinkedIn we have a, I mean I have a, a newsletter a weekly publishing news, newsletter about the technology where you can learn about the technologies and how to learn certain stuff. The newsletter, the name is Technomats, right? So these are the ways that you can connect with me, all right? So you can ping me on anything, if you have anything. And uh, oops, do you have any questions for, for me? Any questions? Any doubts, any questions? Yes. IT awareness is a form of? No. no, 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 IP address is not a digital code because you can change the IP address, VPN. IP address. Okay. Okay, okay. I, the question is okay. So the, he has two questions. One is, is the IP address is part of the digital uh, footprint? No, right? That's the first question. IP address is not your digital trace because you can change your IP address so whenever you collect. I mean, if you use your mobile from the college uh, Wi-Fi, the IP address that is going out of your campus is your college IP address. Whatever you do with your Wi-Fi, oh, I'm, I'm giving you a Okay, whatever you do I with using a college Wi-Fi, the IP address is, will go out of your campus is college IP address. So you can't do anything. You can use VPN to change your VP IP address. So IP address is not your digital trace, right? Like we know show, showing in the movie, right? You can change it, right? So I always use a system with VPN so that no one can use as my uh, IP address, my, I mean, no, trace my IP address. The second question is how someone will uh, understand your browsing behavior just with the help of fingerprint, right? Okay. 
every website that you go, right? Every website that you visit, whether it's Flipkart, Amazon, Google.com, LinkedIn, whatever it may be, uh, even Instagram, whatever we do, what we do is, we first thing first, we re record your fingerprints, right? We store the fingerprint. With that fingerprint, what we can easily get it, and when all, along with the fingerprint, what we record is the device that you are using, right? So every, every website can get this information. Then in you, even you can create a website and you can also record all these things. It's very simple. With a couple of lines of code will get you all the information whoever is using your website. So we record your location, we record your uh, a time zone, we record your device, which device you are using. Whether you are using mobile, whether you are using desktop, in mobile, which platform you are using, whether you are using Chrome or Safari, and which OS you are using, everything we will record and we will store it in the table. We will store it in our database. Whenever we come, conduct a campaign, and whenever we conduct a campaign, you know what is campaign? Let's assume that whenever we do a special offers for certain products, we send this special offer promotion ad to the persons based on the information. Let's assume that I have a special offers for the um, iPhones or I have a special offers for the some application in an iPhone. Then what do I do is I roll out this promotion to the user whomever is using Safari or uh, Chrome from iPhone or Mac device, right? So this is the one way we can track you. And the other thing is behavioral uh, stuff, right? For example, I don't get the same recommendation from the Netflix that you get, right? Every person will get. This is a behavioral recommendation. Based on the movie you watch, based on how long you watch a movie, they change their recommendation. So this is also a part of digital stuff. So we track every stuff that you are doing in a website. Any website you go, we track you, right? Because we saw that we can recommend you the product based on that. We can recommend, we can show the ad based on that. That's a part of this, right? Did I answer your question? Okay, any other question? You can ask me anything if you are interested in this. Yes, no questions? Do you have any other? Yes. So since you have used a lot of classification algorithms, how would exactly computed with the data set? Is, is it mathematically computed with the data set or it understands the nature of the data set? Okay. okay. So to un how to some understand machine learning understand the data is the features. It's a, a nature. For example, I'm creating a system to identify the fruits, right? So I'm going to have a three different fruits, apple, orange, and mango. So now the system will understand the features of these fruits. You know, what is the shape of the apple, right? Shape of the mango and shape of the orange. This is the one feature. And then texture. So all these fruits have a different textures. They have a different dimension. They have a different features, different colors, right? These are the information that the machine learning algorithm will record, will understand. Right? Based on that, it will do the classification. For example, if we try to you know, make an algorithm for the network intrusion detection, so that means the network attack nature is changing right? for, for every minute to minute. How the machine learning algorithm will adopt to the transitions of the attack? Okay, it's like a feedbacking system. So you have to train your system with the always a new data and you have to keep on training your uh, algorithm with the data, right? Because every time, time it changes, you need to feed the system. Okay, this kind of behavior with the networking package, for example, every data packet has certain information, right? So that information is, uh, we, we, we could easily identify some data is uh, real or illegit, right? So we need to keep on training our algorithm by keep on feedbacking the data. So when it comes to network intrusion data set, if it is highly imbalanced, what is the method to balance it? Okay. So there are different algorithms to balance the data set. So one widely used algorithm is a SMOT data algorithm. S-M-O-T, SMOT. So SMOT is a widely used data imbalancing algorithm. What it does is it takes a feed, uh, data from the available uh, group and it makes a synthetic data out of it so that you can create a balancing data out of it. SMOT is the algorithm. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I have researched about the SMOT. If I want to sample the minority classes, 
the default value of the SMOT is at least one class should have at least of six samples. Is it true or not? Not true. You can have it with even many less number of stuff. But the case why they are projecting as a six is you have a enough data to create a synthetic data. With one data, you cannot create multiple synthetic data. So that's why they are insisting you to have a six, but it's not a true that you it's compulsory. You can have it with minimum also. Hi. Currently, of one sample uh, appropriate method to yes. synthetic it. Same. Then what will be the okay? So one way, uh, okay, it's a good question. So I have a only one data for a class, but how do I create a synthetic data for the, for that one data? Is so one approach is you have to, if it is a text data, convert that into a numbers, right? And gather all the related words to the words in the text. Let's like let's make this. I like apple. Now create a words related to like, like love, or I don't like hate apple. So there are a lot of words related to I, right? So same for the apple. So apple is a fruit. Then consider all the fruits. So this way you can create a synthetic data, right? If it is a numbers, is very simple. So we have a numbers data set. You can take an average, and then you can create a generate the number. So to ensure, the, just ensure that the number average is same still. So you can you can still generate the random synthetic data. So one more doubt is uh, the conventional uh, method that uh, some of the professors even suggesting is you have to do the sampling process of to uh, train the model. If I do oversampling, it means the expansion of the data set. If I do undersampling, will uh, there is a possible there I think there is a possibility of loss of information if the, if I do undersampling. What will be the remedy for it? Okay, so sampling is not the compulsory stuff that we do in industry. So when do we do a sampling is whenever we do, we don't have a, uh, enough data, we do a sampling or when we have a lots of data, we do a sampling. So either we go for under sampling. Okay, data loss, even assume that we are using a sampling approach and to ensure that we don't lose the information, so we generally don't drop the data randomly. So we identify data which are already correlated with the existing data. Let's say duplicates. So ident identify the duplicates and then remove one. So that's how it is. There are lots of uh, statistical approach to identify the duplicates. One way is the correlations, right? Oh, oh, one more, last one. Okay. Uh, conventionally, what we've been taught in machine learning is you have to pick a data set, train, I mean, uh, split into train and test, and you have to train the model and all that. For example, the code is working uh, perfectly. If I try to dump the code in a real-time application, where whether it is needed that exact uh, syntax of X train and X test, the data is going to be live. There is no any pre-processed data set would be there. The data set is going to be live. It is going to work on the real-time application. Is the syntax is necessarily needed for training, or the test is alone is enough to process the live data? Okay, so this is the uh, difference between the co college and the industry. So, in industry, we write a code in our local, but we generally don't deploy the code as it is, right? And we train our data in the, I mean, we train our model in the live data and we write the code according to that, right? So, to answer to your questions, we still use a variable as it is. To answer your two questions, we use a variable. Whatever the variable, extend is a variable. Extend is the variable that we use. But the data is a dynamic. So for any data, the code remains same. The code should remain same, right? So what do we do is either we change the format format of the data before you send to this code, or what do we do is we generally write the code that it should accommodate any type, any data types, or any data uh, live data, right? Then X train is X test is to the evaluate. But in where I, what we do is we train, we don't deploy the training code anywhere. Right? So training is always done in is a developer servers or it's a separate servers. We don't give training code or anywhere. So we deploy the model file which is train after generated after training. Right? It's not like a data or a code. It's like a once you train, we create a some dump file, and then that dump file will be deployed in the server. So it's a completely different uh, uh, stuff. The architecture of the 
stuff is completely different. Any other question? So, while I use chat, Okay, now the funny. Okay, so the question is related to. Uh, chat GPT, right? So, why chat GPT is always giving a wrong answer whenever I give a aptitude questions, right? Okay, so the thing is, you are not understanding the chat, the working of chat GPT in a proper way. Chat GPT is not just like a human, just by giving a question, you cannot answer that works for a certain time, right? But in order to use a chat GPT, you have to set the mind of the chat GPT, you should use a proper prompt, right? So, it should you should give a proper context. To the chat GPT, it should know what it is solving. What is the purpose of that question? Why, why do you give this question? And what are you expecting from the question? So, you need to give a proper context to the chat GPT before you ask anything. So, only then you get an accurate response. And chat GPT is a, like a baby which is born just three to four months back, right? And still it is in the RD space, right? So, you cannot get accurate results from chat GPT. And even in industry, we use chat GPT. And even we are integrating with the chat GPT, but we also have the inconsistent problem with the chat GPT, right? So, whenever you use a chat GPT, I, I personally recommend not to use as in your stage, right? Because if you started using chat GPT for every exams and every programming questions, you are dumb, you will be dumb, you never get a value, right? In most of the companies, right? In most of the companies, using a chat GPT is completely blocked. And there is a lot of software to identify whether your code is based on chat GPT or not, AI generated text or not. So, in industry, what we do is we give assignments to the, to the candidate and then we do this pre analysis whether you generated the code or you written the code. And we have a next round of interview to explain the code, right? So, it is not easy. So, I suggest not to use the chat GPT, but still if you are interested, you can use it, but use it with the proper context. You give proper context to the chat GPT, right? And then ask a question, you will get the proper answer and you still, you can get the inconsistency. Right. So, any other doubts, any other questions? So, any system cannot produce 100 percent accuracy, it is always 99, so it is a basic of whether it is a AI, whether it is a human, nothing can give 100 percent result, 99, 99.5, 99 99.7, right. So, I think, uh, so if you have other, any other questions, you can just ping me on LinkedIn or any other uh, uh, medium that I shared with you, right. Right. One thing that I, I would suggest is just because just learning AI ML will not help you, right? So, developing a AI ML application will not help you, just learn some other stuff like architecture deployment as well, yes, yes. Yeah, there are a lot of noise cancellation stuff, that is what you might have studied in DSP. Low pass build, uh, filter, high pass filter, right? There are lots of filter you might have studied, right? Those are for the noise cancellations. How the IEG can be done? Okay. This is a simple. Uh, so, I, I kind of adding a, a two same signal, right? 
So whatever you studied in the DSP, like adding a two, two similar signal will rise the amplitude root, right? So same way, so you can create a synthetic wave, just looking like an EEG, and then you can add it or you can multiply with the EEG data, right? It produces the manipulated data. Or you can generate a EEG signal by feeding the information that you want, and then you can do some addition and multiplication with the original data, you can get it, right? Eventually, it's a form, a signal. The waveform, so you can do any manipulations with that, right? Okay, thank you for this time, thank you for the session. All the best. Learn, try it not to use chat GPT, do it with your mind, right? All the best for your career. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for your valuable insights to our participants, followed by now, with immense honor and privilege, we would like to invite Dr. Malay Kumar Nath, Assistant Professor, Department of ECE, National Institute of Technology, to take over the session. Uh, good afternoon to all. Good afternoon. So today we'll talk about deep learning applications in biomedical images for identifying the diagnostic information. So in this case, we'll talk about the biomedical images such as uh, retinal images, skin cancer images, MRI images, tumors, or COVID-19 database, etc. Already. Uh, uh, Mr. Sarma Srabanan told uh, that uh, there are different type of machine learning algorithms and uh, these different algorithms are used either in case of machine learning or in case of deep learning, deep learning concept. But when we are talking about this deep learning, this deep learning was recently started. But if you look into the core of this machine learning or deep learning, it was started long back even of your birth or long back even of my birth also. In the year of 1857 or something. But why this uh, deep learning and machine learning uh, makes a very important uh, part of our daily research for all kind of applications? And what exactly makes the things to be much more automate to identify the features? As already uh, uh, Mr. Sravanan told 
that we are interested about the features, features from the database. And he has given a very nice example about taking uh, some of the data points along the x-axis and some of the data points along the y-axis. And uh, when we are looking into this data, and basically you can able to predict what will be your future data. Basically, this is nothing but we are talking about uh, this is a mathematical procedure or mathematical uh, method of regression. So that means we are predicting some future output based on certain things. And also, he has uh, very nicely explained that uh, about the future predictions, one of uh, your uh, colleague has asked that uh, if we are uh, using certain uh, algorithm for a real time data, basically how it can able to predict. And he has uh, nicely explained that in industry and research what exactly the difference happens. And uh, basically this is a kind of reinforcement learning. So now I'll just start a very basic things that how this machine learning was started and how this machine learning today now it is coming to the deep learning. I'll start with a very simple example of your exclusive OR gate because most of the students are from uh, second semester or third semester and they will understand this concept that how this machine learning concept was really started. So I will take it to you know, to the basic concept as told by Mr. Sabranan that uh, we are looking for some mathematics behind it, right? And we are looking for the databases. Based on the databases, we are predicting certain outputs. So now I will just go through this uh, basic mathematics, then I will come to this diagnostic information, how we can able to process it. So here I will uh, uh, just uh, skip all these things and uh, I will talk about this uh, machine learning algorithm. If we look into this machine learning algorithm, basically in this case we are looking uh, a computer program which can take the information or which can take the information from the database and perform some task such that the performance has to improve with respect to the experience. So that means whenever we are looking into the performance and it has to improve for all the time. If I will talk about the case of a learning with the uh, or we can make a robot able to work. So in this case working is a task and how we can able to program the robot is nothing but the learning. So if we look into this learning algorithms, basically we are looking for the experience and where we will get the experience? We can get the experience from the databases and based on the experience we are dividing this machine learning algorithm either to be supervised, unsupervised, semi-supervised, self uh, semi-supervised, reinforcement or reinforcement uh, and uh, transfer learning. So already you might have heard about this uh, learning algorithms. If we look into this uh, supervised learning algorithms, in this case there is some annotation is present. So what do you mean by annotations? You might have heard about the Mahabharat. In this case, one uh, uh, guru was there, Dronacharya, and another guru was uh, another, uh, that means uh, uh, one student was there, Arjun, and another is Ekalabhya. Ekalabhya has put one statue of Dronacharya and learned uh, this uh, uh, about this uh, how to uh, do or how to fight. So in this case, the learning of Arjun from Dronacharya is nothing but a supervised learning. That means there is some annotation is present and learning of this Ekalabhya from Guru Dronacharya is nothing but unsupervised learning. That means if we we'll talk about the example of how exactly we are learning our alphabets, our teachers are telling us that this is A, A. After telling multiple times, you can able to identify, yes, this is A. But you might have heard about this is Sony Bio laptop. If we we'll look into the Sony Bio, so the Bio, how it is written? B is written something like this and A is written something like a dumbbell shape and in between which there is a dot is present. But if I will show this logo, then you can easily identify this is A, but none of your parents or teacher told at any point of time that this is A. So that means in this case some annotations is required, but in case of unsupervised learning, there is no annotations. If we will take the example of this non-annotations, when we will take uh, the example of the vegetables. When you are a very child and you are going to the market and purchasing some vegetables with your parents and when you are coming to the home and your mother says that can you able to separate it? You can able to separate which one is potato, which one is tomato, which one is brinjal. On what basis you can able to do the separation? That is looking into certain features, looking into certain characteristics, shape, size, color, etc, etc. This is a kind of unsupervised learning. You are looking into the feature information 
and we can able to do the separation. So uh, next is called your self-supervised learning. This is a kind of learning in which uh, there is some supervised learning without human annotated labels. One of the best example you are writing something on your email and what is the next word you are going to write that can be easily predicted, how it can be done. So this is a kind of uh, self-supervised learning. Next is called the semi-supervised learning in which there is a small portion of labeled data and a large number of unlabeled data is present. And in this case, we are using the SCAN, that is generative adversarial network, which works on the principle of generate, uh, that is called your generator and discriminator. The generator main work is to generate the fake data and the discriminator main work to discriminate the fake data from the real data. Next is called uh, the reinforcement learning. What is this reinforcement learning? We are working, uh, means after four years, we will work in some company. Now, what exactly is happening? So, suppose you have to perform certain tasks in such a manner that your higher authority, your CEO, your boss will be always happy on us. That means one of the best example is called your automatic driving car. So, how this automatic driving car is working? It is taking the feedback from the environment. Based on the feedback, it has to take one decision, such a manner that it has to move forward. So that means it has an agent, it has an environment, it is taking a feedback from the environment and based on the feedback, it has to perform certain tasks such that each time the reward is get maximized and this is a kind of reinforcement learning. So when we are talking about this uh, different type of learning algorithms, basically we are using some mathematical formulation about that. So if we look into this uh, 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 supervised learning algorithms, basically we are looking for two kind of tasks. One is called your regression task, another is called your classification task. In regression task, we are finding or predicting the output based on the certain input. And in case of classification task, we are performing certain kind of classifications. We will try to understand, already uh, Mr. Sarvan told that how we can able to predict the output based on the some past input. So that is nothing but a regression task. What exactly this regression task tells about? So this is nothing but I am just going to discuss a little mathematics behind this regression task. Yeah. So in this case, we have to formulate a linear equation from some input variables. That means we have to build a system that can take a vector x as input and predict the value of the scalar that is equal to y. So that means this y is nothing but your prediction. So this prediction can be represented as the y hat is equal to w transpose into x. So what is this x? This x is nothing but your input and y hat is called your prediction. And this y hat is depending upon this parameter that is called your w. That is nothing but your weights. This weight can take negative value, can take positive value. So if it is positive, that means it increases the prediction as the input feature increases and it takes the negative value, that means it increases the prediction as the input feature vector decreases. So what is my aim? My aim is to make this prediction is almost equal to this y. How we can able to do it? Already uh, Mr. Samran told that we have to calculate the norm, the Euclidean distance, we have to calculate the mean square error, we have to calculate the Mahalanobis distance, etc, etc. But in this case, we will calculate the mean square error. That means if I will calculate the distance between this y hat and y and if both are identical, then what will happen to this? This will become equal to 0. I am taking the square. The reason behind is that if I will subtract y hat from y or y, hat, y from y hat, this will give rise to your symmetric operation. That means your square term will nullify the negative signs. So that means this is nothing but your MAC. This MAC is equal to 0. That means I can say the prediction is almost equal to y. And in this case, I am dividing this m to uh, make it to or calculate uh, the mean of this or mean of all the samples. So now how I can able to get it? Because I have to determine this w. So for that reason, I have to calculate the gradient. So that means I have to calculate the gradient of this MAC with respect to W and if I will simplify this expression, I will land in this simple learning algorithm. So that means this is called the learning procedure by the help of a linear regression analysis. 
So uh, here, what we have understood, we have to understood that we have to calculate this W that is called your parameters and these parameters have to be computed in such a manner that this Y hat, the predicted value is must be equal to the Y. So that means it will become equal to 0. So here I am calculating the gradient. So the gradient should not vanish. If the gradient will vanish, then we cannot able to predict the value of W. Right? So this is uh, the, about your linear regression. We will not talk about this overfitting, underfitting and all these conditions. Uh, uh, so we will just uh, talk about that how exactly this machine learning comes into play here. So in this case, I have taken a uh, equation that is equal to y is equal to wt x plus b. So in this case, I want to do some classifications. How I will do the classification? Just I will go to uh, one example of this. Yeah, look at here. So in this case, there are two things are present. One is called the positive class, another is called the negative class. I have to do the classification. So that means I have to draw a straight line in such a manner that the positive class gets separated from the negative class. So that means this is the equation of a straight line and this equation of the straight line is depending upon the parameters that is called your angle, that is called your slope and another is called your bias. The bias is nothing but representing the distance from the origin to that straight line. So now this bias can be or it can be said as the intercept. It can be uh, discussed uh, like that the y intercept or it can be discussed as the x intercept. And this slope is nothing but the slope of this line. So now how it can be uh, processed or how it can be analyzed. So this can be uh, looking into by the help of a simple example which you uh, must have studied in your uh, digital electronics. That is nothing but a simple gate. That is nothing but called your logical OR gate. If we will consider a two input logical OR gate, that means there are two inputs are present and a single output is present. So that means in case of a logical OR gate, we know that the output is equal to 0 if and only if both the inputs are 0 and the output is equal to 1 if any one of the input is equal to 1. So now I want to represent this representation by the help of a neural network and perform the classification of the output of a two input OR gate and how it can be achieved. So for that reason what I did, I have taken uh, the uh, two variables that is equal to x1 and x2 and the output that is equal to y on a graphical representation. So I have taken 0, 0 and representing by a black dot and the rest of the combinations that is equal to 0, 1, 1, 1 and 1, 0, I will make it to that is equal to 1. So now what I have to do, I have to use a classification technique, I have to draw a straight line in such a manner that the output of the two input logical OR gate will be separated. So in this case, this is straight line is depending upon certain parameters. One parameter is called your W, that is nothing but your slope. And another parameter is called your B, that is known as your bias or that is known as your intercept. Now, how we can able to identify? If I will say this uh, Y is nothing but a function of some W1, W2 as well as the B, that is called your bias term. And X1, X2 are nothing but your input which is given to you. So now if I will consider this W1 is equal to 1.0 and W2 is equal to 1.0 and B is equal to 0.5, then I can see that for 0, 0 input, your output is negative and for rest of the combination, your output is positive. So I can able to do the separation in this case. So this same thing is happening in case of a two input logical AND gate. But what will happen in case of an exclusive OR gate? Can we able to tell how it can be able to achieve in case of exclusive OR gate and that's what the development of the hidden layers is coming into picture and more and more number of layers are coming into picture which tells about your deep learning. So that means this neural network is landing into machine learning and this uh, more number of layers is landing into your deep neural network concept. So now how exactly it is happening? So we know that in case of a two input exclusive OR gate, your output is equal to zero when both the inputs are identical. That means zero, zero, I am getting the output is equal to zero for one, one, and getting the output is equal to zero. But rest of the combinations, the output is equal to one. If I will represent this by the help of a graphical representation, this will be the thing that I am getting. So that means this is your zero, zero, the output is equal to zero, for 1, 1, your output is equal to 0, but for rest of the combination, your output is equal to 1. 
So now, if I want to do the classification, then I cannot able to do it by the help of a single straight line. I require two straight line to achieve it. Right? So how I can able to achieve it by the help of a single straight line and that leads to a multi-layer neural network concept. How exactly it can be achieved? This is nothing but a mathematical formulation. So here we will use some transformation that is called your radial basis function. Now I will just uh, uh, tell about that how this radial basis function helps in uh, doing this classification in case of your exclusive organ. So this radial basis function is nothing but a mapping function maps the input vector that is equal to x to your phi x. So in this case one we are talking about the receptor and this receptor as we are moving away from the receptor the value will either increase or the value will either decrease. So now I will take the same example and that is nothing but a two input exclusive OR gate. This is the two input exclusive OR gate output representation for 0 0 the output is equal to 0 for 1 1 the output is equal to 0 but for rest of the combination the output is equal to 1. So now I will consider the four receptor that is equal to T1, T2, T3 and T4. As already I told, as we are moving away from the receptor, the value is either increasing or decreasing. If I will consider any one receptor that is equal to T1, then this T2 uh, and as well as the T3 are equidistant from your T1. So I can able to calculate your standard deviation for this that is equal to sigma. Right now, after computing the standard deviation for each receptor, I have to compute your phi that is called your transformation function or that is called your basis function that is radial basis function. So, for each receptor, I am calculating what is your phi 1x, phi 2x, phi 3x, as well as phi 4x. After computing this phi 1x to phi uh, 4x, then what I will do for each of the input that is equal to 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, I will compute what is your phi 1 what is your phi 2, what is your phi 3 and phi 4. So that means for each of the input 0 0 I will compute what is your corresponding phi 1, for 0 0 what is corresponding phi 2, for 0 0 what is corresponding phi 3 and for 0 0 what is the corresponding phi 4. So now after computing this if I will suitably choose this W that is equal to for this phi 1 that is minus 1.0 for phi 2 that is equal to plus 1.0 and phi 3 plus 1.0 and phi 4 is equal to minus 1.0 and I will use this summation i is equal to 1 to 4 double i phi i and I will calculate this value I can see that for 0 0 and 1 1 the output is negative and for rest of the combination your output is positive. Then what this radial basis function is doing? This radial basis function making a lower dimensional to higher dimensional that means it makes your 2D feature vector to a 4D feature vector. How you can realize it in the case of your neural network? It can be realized by the help of addition or introduction of a new layer into the neural network. Previously, there are only the input layer and the output layer is present. So that means there are more number of layers are introduced into the network. So this is nothing but the hidden layer. So that means by the help of a high radial basis function, we are making a 2D feature vector to a 4D feature vector. I am increasing the dimension. What we understood from here, we understood from here is that as we are going increasing the number of layers, the more and more complex feature about the data can be extracted. So that's why already in previous uh, uh, that means a discussion, Sarah has already told that means we are taking the features. They, he has given a very nice example that taking the databases, there is one feature engineering is present. So in case of your traditional based methods, we are extracting the features and from these features, we are selecting the features or we are performing the work of your compressed sensing or principal component analysis or we have to remove the correlations present between the features and we are extracting some suitable features. And these suitable features are given to the machine learning algorithms like your support vector machine or decision tree or random forest or KNN etc etc. And we can able to do the classifications. But in case of your deep learning, we need not to do or we need not to go for the feature engineering. We don't, the feature engineering can be done by the help of this neural network or by the help of your convolution. If you are going increasing or adding more and more number of layers, the layer which is very close to the input can able to extract some basic features and the layer which is very far away from the input can able to uh, extract some complex feature about the images or the data. So that's what your deep neural network comes into picture. So what I have given the example, I have started the example of a simplest neural network. 
And this simplest neural network is nothing but which is I have given by the help of an example of a two input AND gate or OR gate. This is nothing but a perceptron. Now this perceptron cannot be able to separate the classes which are complex or non-linear classes cannot be separated. So for that reason, we are introducing another layer that is nothing but a hidden layer and this is done by the help of a radial basis function. So this radial, if we are going increasing the more number of layers, then more and more complex features can be extracted. That's what exactly we are lending into the deep learning. But if we look into this deep learning concept, it is not only this uh, deep learning, it has consists of many number of layers. I'll just uh, quickly tell what are these layers are basically present in this case and why these layers are present. Then you can able to design your own deep neural network models. So I'll just uh, tell what are the layers are present. So Yeah. So here are the different layers, the components of convolutional neural network. The first layer is called your input layer. Then we are performing the work of your convolution. Then we are using some ReLU activation function. Then we are using some pulling layer and fully connected layer. Why these layers are there? It has specific meaning. Why we are using these layers or what is the necessity of these layers? As already I told, we are using more number of layers means we can able to extract more and more complex features. How we can able to extract? You might have studied your convolution in case of your 1D. What convolution is giving? The convolution is extracting the feature based on certain kernels or some uh, that means a, a, a window which is having a smaller length to that of your complete signal that already you have studied in case of your 1D convolution and this 1D convolution used for your filtering. Here also we are doing the same work of your filtering. So now the input layer is nothing but your images. Now we are using a convolution and this convolution is done by the help of certain kernels. We are using different uh, layer, that means number of kernels, so which will give rise to your depth. So this will generate your feature map. Now, after this convolution, we have to go for your ReLU activation function. What is the necessity of this ReLU activation function? Already I told, in case of your regression model or in case of your classification model, we have to find the weights or we have to identify the weights. How the weights can be identified? By calculating the gradient. And when we are calculating the gradient, the gradient should not vanish. If the gradient vanishes, then we cannot able to learn the weights. So for that reason, what we have to do, we have to use a ReLU activation function and this ReLU activation function introduces the non-linearity into, into the network and provides a non-saturating gradients. That means it can uh, provide or it will not make the gradient to be vanished. Then we are using a pooling layer. What is the pooling layer? What is the importance of the pooling layer? Basically, when we are performing convolution after convolution, that is called your stacking convolution, basically the network can able to extract or memorize the features. And why this, uh, um, uh, that means network can memorize the features? Because we are using convolution after convolution, that is known as the stacking convolution. And why we are going for this? Basically, this can be done for the case of your augmentation of of your data by the help of your rotation, flipping, etc, etc. So for that reason, we have to overcome that difficulty and we are using this pooling operation. So people have used different type of pooling operation like your max pooling, average pooling, as well as global pooling. Then we are using a fully connected layer, which is nothing but a softmax uh, and uses a cross entropy uh, loss function uh, basically to do the classifications. So now, if we look into, all we have completed that is input layer, convolution layer and what is the importance of your ReLU activation function. Now what is your pooling layer? This will provide your translation invariance. So now how exactly uh, will happen? So basically in case of your convolution, this limitation of a feature map in case of your convolution layer which record the precise position of those features in the input. That means a small movement in the position of the feature in the, in the input, image that will result a in a small movement in the position of the feature in the image that will result in a small movement in the position of the feature in the image that will result in a small movement in the position of the feature in the image that will result in a small movement in the position of the feature in the image that will result in a small movement in the position of the feature in the image that will result in a small movement in the position of the feature in the image that will result in a small movement in the position of the feature in the image that will result in a small movement in the position of the feature in the image that will result in a small movement in the position of the fe
basically people are using your pulling operation to overcome that and it has the advantages that is called your translation as well as rotational invariant so the advantages so that is called your translation as well as rotational uh, invariant so the some kind of translation to overcome uh, the uh, correlations present in the data or so here uh, i'll just go to that yeah dropout so basically dropout is used for uh, avoid or to overcome too much of correlation and basically we are using 0.25 to uh, 0 0.50 of your dropout to overcome this then after that we are using uh, this uh, uh, softmax algorithm for finding or performing the classifications so when we are designing this neural network you have to very much sure about the number of parameters because already sir told that means if you have more number of parameters basically it will take much time if we look into your machine learning algorithm it can provide your classification output within a certain time or a very small time compared to your deep neural network in case of your deep neural network as the number of depth is very high the number of layers is very high it requires more time for back propagation and learning the weights so for that reason you have to know about the number of parameters which are the layers basically contributing to the number of parameters so the input layer nothing to learn so that means the number of parameters is equal to zero but the convolution layer it basically take part in the learning process and the number of parameters is computed by the width of the filter the height of the filter the number of filters in the previous layers and the filters in the current layer as well as the bias storm similarly in case of your pulling layer there is no parameters to lock that means the number of parameters is equal to zero and the fully connected layer the number of parameters can be computed by the number of neurons in the current layer into the number of neurons in the previous layer plus one into the neurons in the current layer so this is uh, uh, the all about the parameters here i have given one example that which layer is computing more number of parameters this is a uh, cnn network which is consist of input layer two convolutional layer two pulling layer uh, two fully connected and one softmax layer and if we look into the number of parameters the number of parameters for the input layer is equal to zero for convolution layer it is coming to be 608 and for the fully connected layer the highest number of parameters are coming so that means when you are making this complete set for multiple number of times you have to be very sure that how many number of layers i will use for my particular application then within a very short instant or short time i can able to get the classification output so that is the whole idea that we have discussed so what we have discussed we have started with the machine learning concept that is nothing but which requires a programming knowledge which requires about the information about the data and based on that there are different type of learning algorithms are present and initially this learning algorithm was started with a perceptron by the help of a neural network and as we are going increasing the number of layers basically it will give rise to your uh, multi-layer neural network and when we are adding more and more number of layers it will give rise to your deep neural network concept and when we are talking about this deep neural network concept basically we are looking into that what are the layers to be present after which so what exactly the importance of each and individual layers so now we'll come to the application part of this that how we are going for the classification of the different diagnostic information from these uh, images so here what exactly we have done these are the works that is carried out at NIT Puducherry by the research scholars so here we will talk about skin cancer classification tumor classification glaucoma classification and uh, ended with our presentations basically the main motto of discussing this information is that we have developed many number of networks we have used transfer learning to identify the diagnostic information from the skin images that is skin cancer images to identify whether there is a skin cancer is present or not present so whenever we are using these models the model is working fine for a one set of database and may not working fine for another set of database and we have tested with a multiple number of images that means a different kind of images for different purpose or different kind of applications the first work that we have started uh, actually it is not the first work the first work is nothing but the retinal images right so but i will start in a different way that is the skin cancer classification as well as lesion contrast enhancement 
and basically this work was done by the help of a neural network uh, model. So, uh, uh, before starting with this uh, model and how exactly it is performing the classification, just I want to tell what exactly this is skin cancer and what are these variations. So, basically this is skin cancer is nothing but abnormal growth of the skin cells and that lead to your skin cancer. There are many types of skin cancer. Here I have mentioned three types. One is called your basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma as well as melanoma. But if we look into the detailed classifications already by the help of uh, Dr. Vipin Das, we can able to do the classification of the skin cancer into melanoma as well as benign. Again, melanoma is uh, divided into multiple classes and benign also divided into multiple number of classes. Right? But we are interested in your melanoma classification because uh, this will give rise to your increase in death rate. So, uh, if we look into the statistics of your WHO, that is the melanoma accounts for approximately 1 in 5 skin cancers and uh, with approximately this much number of cases and this much number of deaths in uh, globally uh, in 2020. According to your international agency for research on cancer, the new cases of melanoma per year will increase by more than 50% from 2020 to 2040. So, if we look into the survival rate uh, based on the statistic, then the, if the disease is detected at the early stage, then uh, it is almost equal to 96% for the last 5 years. If it is detected in the advanced stage, then the survival rate is reduced at, uh, to nearly about 5 percent. So, basically before the deep learning, the doctors or that is the, the dermatologist basically identify the skin cancer based on certain rules and that rule is known as your ABCD rule and this ABCD rule tells about to identify the skin cancer based on asymmetry, border, color, diameter as well as evolution. But when we are looking for this uh, uh, ABCD rule, basically this varies from dermatology to dermatology because it is subject dependent. Sometimes it will create some errors. And if the dermatology find that yes or suspect that there is a skin cancer, then he will refer to a biopsy and with the biopsy cost is very, very high and the appointment with the uh, dermatology is also very high. So for that reason, People have started, researchers have started to identify the automatic skin cancers by the help of machine learning as well as deep learning. Many methods have been developed for this automatic screening purposes. So here we have uh, used the dermoscopy images as well as the macro images taken by the help of a digital camera or taken by the help of your mobile phone and to identify the skin cancers, whether there is a skin cancer is present or not present. So here I have shown the three images that is taken from this database which is given in this reference number 8 and uh, if we look into the skin cancer images, the images are uh, looking or the skin cancer is looking uh, very very dark compared to the background. And if we look into the skin cancer as well as the background image, sometimes what will happen, the contrast is uh, very, very low so that we cannot able to identify or the dermatologist cannot able to identify whether there is a skin cancer is present or not. Sometimes what will happen if uh, we are uh, belonging to uh, a country like India or Africa, then what will happen, our complexion is very, very black, not like uh, the Europeans or the um, uh, foreign countries. So basically what will happen, this hairs which is present over our body that will give rise to your misleading concept of uh, identifying the skin cancers. So people thought of uh, how it can be able to identify by the help of this machine learning as well as the deep learning algorithms. So people have developed many methods and I have summarized here but I am not going to discuss this what we have exactly done to identify the skin cancer that I am going to discuss here. So in this case. We have started the work of this skin cancer detection uh, by different approaches. One approach is called the hybrid approach, next is called your classification, next uh, by the help of feature extraction, by the help of a pre-trained network and uh, then the classification and uh, uh, the enabling of the different classification algorithms. What is this hybrid based method? In case of this hybrid based method, we have tried to separate or the segment the skin cancer by the help of a unit architecture. So that means it is nothing but a segmentation algorithm. 
then we are fed into the deep classifiers and in this case we are using the dense net uh, network for performing the classifications. Next we are uh, used the pre-trained network. If we look into your MATLAB there are uh, some 19 pre-trained uh, uh, neural networks, uh, deep neural networks are present and we are using the transfer learning concept to identify the skin cancer by the help of these pre-trained networks. Then in the third step uh, we have tried to extract the features by the help of a pre-trained network and used the classifiers like your traditional classifiers like support vector machine, neural network, support vector machine, k nearest neighborhood classifier, decision tree. So what exactly we are doing? We are using the deep neural network to extract the features, not to do the classification. Already I told in case of a deep neural network, then layers, the different layers can able to extract the different features. The layer which is very close to the input can able to extract the basic features. The layer which is very far away from the input can able to extract the complex features. If your data is very very complex, then we can use more number of layers to extract the complex features. Now we will cut the layer at a certain uh, level and we will extract these features and these features are fed into the traditional machine learning algorithm to do the classifications. So in this case, we are using the support vector machine, decision tree, uh, as well as K, uh, K and classifiers to do the classification. Then we are using the potential strength of the different classifiers and perform the work of enabling and do the classification. And all type of classification methods have been published in uh, this paper. So uh, you can have a look into this paper and uh, get the more detailed insight into the, uh, the classification techniques. So if we look into this hybrid based method, it consists of two steps. One is called your segmentation, another is nothing but your classification. And this segmentation is performed by the help of the unit architecture and the classification is performed by the help of dense net architecture. So this is the unit architecture that we have used for this segmentation and this is the dense net architecture that have been used. So next we are using the pre-trained networks. What are the pre-trained network? Already VGG 16, VGG 19, ResNet, uh, ReNet, mobile net, uh, uh, efficient net, all these networks are present. So we are using your transfer learning concept to apply into the skin cancer to do the classification. So in this case, we are taking the input image, we are using the pre-trained networks and this pre-trained network have been used for the classification purpose and the output is obtained. In the second case, what we are doing, we are using the pre-trained network for feature extraction. So that means at a particular layer, we can able to extract the features, then we are feeding these features into the classifier network to do the classification and we are getting the classification output. So here we are using the different pre-trained network like your SqueezeNet, GoogleNet, ResNet, ResNet 50, ResNet 101, DarkNet, uh, DarkNet 15, SuffleNet like this uh, up to AlexNet we are using. And for all the networks, the depth of the layers, depth as well as layer, the connection parameters, the input layer dimensions as well as the remarks have been represented from the literatures. And these layers have been used for the classification and in this case, we are using the transfer learning concept. Next, what we have done? Uh, we have used uh, the potential strength of the different pre-trained networks. So we are taking the input image, we are using or feeding these input images to the different pre-trained networks and we are uh, uh, taking the features or summarize the features uh, or we are uh, summed up here and then passed into a support vector machine classifier and we are getting the classification output. So in this case we are using some traditional classifiers like your support vector machine, k nearest neighborhood classifier as well as your decision tree classifiers. Now we will come to uh, the databases. In this case we are using a numerous databases that is available freely uh, in the website uh, and that is PH2. ISIC, ISIC uh, 2017, 2018, 2016, uh, ISBI 2016 and ISBI 2017. The detailed description you can get it uh, from these uh, uh, references about the databases. So now after classification we are using some different classifiers like your accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, Jacquard, dice, similarity coefficient, uh, Haramadama or precision F1 score. You might have art that why you are going for a different type of accuracy. Can you tell me what is the uh, demerit of calculation of your accuracy as well as what is the demerit of calculation of your F1 score. So for that reason people have used the other type of uh, accuracy measures like your uh, Matthew correlation coefficient, Kappa scores, etc, etc. Because accuracy is only computed uh, 
uh, the correctly classified samples. But in case of your F1 score, what exactly is happening? It is not uh, symmetric. Symmetric in the sense, suppose you have a positive class and you have a negative class. Now you are getting the confusion matrix for positive as well as negative class. Now you do the in interchange. That means you make the negative class to the positive class and positive class to the negative class and you will calculate your confusion matrix and calculate your F1 score. This is not symmetric. Your F1 score is not symmetric. Right? So in order to overcome that type of difficulty people have used this uh, Matthew correlation coefficient. So in our study we have used different optimizers, different batch size, different epoch to analyze how these pre-trained networks have been performed uh, for uh, different optimizers, batch size as well as epoch and we have computed the accuracy at the initial stage. Here I have shown one uh, confusion matrix result for a dense net uh, 201 and uh, uh, we are trying to classify benign as well as malignant. So in the, by the help of your dense net, we are getting the accuracy to be 87.4%. But if we will take the exception, we are getting the accuracy of 86.2%. So the, all the pre-trained networks for different optimizers, different epochs, different batch size, as well as different learning rate, the accuracy, precision, sensitivity, specificity, dissimilarity coefficient as well as F1 score have been computed and reported. And it is found that the dense net 201 provides the highest accuracy of 87.43% for your RMS prof optimizer with a epoch of 25 and batch size of 30 and learning rate of 0 0.001. So here the performance metric for pre-trained network using the segmented result. So that means we are segmenting the images and we are passing into the classifiers. This is the performance metric for uh, the network with augmentation. So this is the confusion matrix of a pre-trained network and classifiers. That means the pre-trained network have been used for extracting the features and these features have been given to the classifier to perform the work of your classification. So here I have given one example of ResNet 18 as well as the AlexNet. In case of your ResNet 18 used for your feature extraction and uh, you are using the other classifier that is called your support vector machine and it is giving 85.6% and AlexNet is providing 83.2%. So this complete uh, summary have been represented here for the different pre-trained network have been used for the feature extraction and the different classifiers have been used for the classification for different optimizers, epochs, batch size, learning rate. And if you look into this, you can see that when the VGG16 have been used for the feature extraction by the help of this support vector machine classifier as a classifier, we are getting the highest accuracy of 94.6%. So this is the summary that we are getting in this case of your uh, using the uh, pre-trained network as feature extraction and uh, different classifier as the classification. This is the concatenation of the different pre-trained network for uh, performing the classification answers. So in this case, we are using two different pre-trained network for uh, extracting the, fe the features. That means the features have been concatenated or uh, they can be used by taking the mean values and uh, we are calculating uh, the classification accuracy. And in case of your uh, dense net 201 and dense net 50, we are getting the highest accuracy of 87.4%. And in case of dense net 201 and mobile net, we are getting the accuracy of 88%. So this have been uh, computed for the other uh, measures uh, that means other uh, pre-trained networks also. So if we look into the conclusion of this uh, skin cancer detection by the different methods that is called your hybrid based method in which we are using a segmentation by the unit architecture and the dense net have been used for the classification. Then in second approach, we are using the different pre-trained network for the classification. In the third case, we are using the pre-trained network for feature extraction and a different uh, traditional machine learning approach for classification. As well as in the fourth case, we are enabling the or we are taking the potential strength of the different pre-trained network for calculating the features and uh, different uh, machine learning approaches for classification. And we are getting, uh, this is the conclusion that is called dissimilarity coefficient has to be found by 99.83% in case of your the hybrid based method. And in case of your pre-trained network, we are getting the highest accuracy of 87.43. And when we are using the pre-trained network with a different other classifier, then your VGG16 is performing the best result. So from what we got from this case, 
From this we get that the accuracy is very very less in case of your pre-trained network. Then we thought of improving the accuracy by using some pre-processing as well as the post-processing stage. So for that reason we have done two pre-processing, uh, sorry one pre-processing as well as one post-processing stage. In pre-processing we try to enhance the contrast that is by the help of a deep neural network algorithm and in second case we try to local, localize the uh, skin cancer lesion from the uh, skin cancer images or the macro images. So the first work that we have tried to improve the uh, classification accuracy by using some pre-processing step which is known as the lesion contrast enhancement. How the lesion contrast enhancement will improve our work of classifications. So what is the importance of your less, uh, that is contrast enhancement? If we look into the skin cancer in case of a dark people or a dark complexion people, then it is very difficult to identify the skin cancer because the skin cancer color is dark as well as the background color is also dark. And sometimes the hair, the growth of hair on the skin cancer uh, images will give rise to your uh, misleading uh, results. So for that reason, we have to use some pre-processing steps as well as we have to use the contrast enhancement. How we can able to achieve this contrast enhancement by the help of, or help of deep neural network. Many researchers have used the different deep neural network to use the contrast enhancement. So in this case, we have used the EMST algorithm that is efficient modified sigmoid transfer function to enhance the contrast. What is this modified efficient uh, uh, sigmoid transfer algorithm? So these are the different, uh, before coming to that, these are the nothing but the different uh, methods that have been already used in the literatures for enhancing the contrast of your skin cancers. If we look into uh, these methods, then the most important limitation of these methods is that uh, the enhancement is weakly illuminated images, high computational complexity, fail to hand, uh, handle large histogram values, generate the artifacts due to overstretching, computational complexity is high, etc, etc. So these are some of the limitations that is already present in the literatures that is available for the skin cancer contrast enhancement. So for that reason, we have developed a method that is known as the EMST based method that is efficient based modified sigmoid transfer for enhancing the dermatological macro images and this method has been presented or published in this uh, journal and you have a look into this journal how exactly we are enhancing the contrast. So in this case the block diagram uh, of this proposed method is represented in this diagram. So in this case we are taking the input image which is nothing but a RGB color image. Now we have to do the processing in HSV color image that is called uh, we have to convert this RGB color image to the HSV that is hue, saturation as well as value. Now uh, here there are three channels are present, one is called your hue, another is called your saturation, another is called your value component. To th this value component is passed into this modified efficient net regressor. Basically this is nothing but a regression network and this regression network will compute the crossover point that is called your beta. What is crossover point? Try to understand, I have a skin cancer. Now, uh, or that is called your skin cancer image. This skin cancer, a particular region has the cancer and other regions don't have the cancer. Now, I will pass this image into a simplest uh, segmentation algorithm. You might have studied about your ORSU segmentation. ORSU segmentation is nothing but a histogram based segmentation. Basically, what we are using, we are uh, using a histogram based technique to segment the skin lesion from the background. Now, what is this crossover point? This crossover point is a point where the dye similarity coefficient is the highest. Try to understand. This is your skin cancer. Now, we are using a ORSU segmentation based method. So, now I will get the two things. One is called your segmented skin cancer. Another is called your background. So, I am interested in your segmented skin cancer. Now, this is segmented skin cancer is nothing but the output which is generated by this segmentation algorithm. There is a ground truth image is present. Now I will compare this segmentation output with the ground truth and I will calculate the dye similarity coefficient. So for the value or for the threshold value for where the dye similarity coefficient is highest is known as your crossover point. So what is crossover point? Crossover point is a threshold value 
for which the Orso threshold based method will provide the highest dice similarity coefficient. And basically, this crossover point is computed by the help of a modified efficient net regressor. Now, this crossover point is given to a uh, uh, sigmoid uh, transfer function to enhance the value component. Once the value component is enhanced, then this hue and saturation are concatenated to give rise to your HSV color image. Then this HSV color image is converted into your RGB for displaying purposes. So this is the whole idea about that how you can able to enhance the contrast of your skin cancer. So in this case, what exactly is happening? So we are using uh, the enhanced value component is computed by using this modified sigmoid transfer function. So this modified sigmoid transfer function takes the input value component that is VI and it will provide the crossover point. So this crossover point is fed into or, uh, uh, or this crossover point is uh, predicted by efficient uh, net regressor. How it is computed? So here I am calculating this V0MN that is nothing but the input value component that is called your, uh, sorry, this is called your enhanced value component based on the input value component. So VOMN will be represented by 1 upon 1 by 1 plus exponential alpha into beta minus VIMN. What is this VIMN? VIMN is nothing but your input value component before contrast enhancement. And what is this beta? This beta is representing your crossover point. What is crossover point? Crossover point is the point where the segmentation value by the Orsu threshold is maximum. That is called your dice similarity coefficient. And alpha is nothing but your modified, uh, uh, that is sigmoid transfer function shape parameter. That is called your alpha. So in this case, we have taken alpha is equal to 20. So now, what is this alpha? What is the important role of this alpha? Basically, what exactly we are doing here? We are trying to increase the contrast between the skin lesion as well as the background. How we can able to do it? Try to understand the basic concept behind this. The skin cancer is black in color and the background is white in color. Now, what I will do? I will make this black to be more black and I will make this white to be more white. What does it mean? That means I am performing a work of your stretching operation. Stretching means, uh, that means the black pixels I will pull towards the zero values and bright pixels I will pull towards 255 depending upon the number of bits. So here we are talking about 8 bits, so that's why we are taking 0 to 255. So this is called a stretching operation and this stretching operation will make the black pixel to be more black and white pixel to be more white. So this can be performed by this MST shape parameter. So that means this modified, why it is called modified? Because you are introducing one alpha parameter here that is equal to alpha. Depending upon the value of alpha, so what will happen? The black pixels will become equal to more black and white pixel will become equal to more white. I am giving a very simple example of this. Suppose I am teaching machine learning to your class and in my class there are 100 students are present. So suppose out of this 100 student, few students scored the range between um, suppose 50 to 55 right mark and few students secured some 56 to 60 suppose that means there are two group of people are present 50 to 55 and 55 to uh, or 56 to 60 now i have to uh, grade them so how will grade them because 55 is almost equal to 56 when i will grade 55 people some grade and then 56 people will tell sir he is almost the same as my grade or my mark. Then why you are giving a two different grades to us? So what I will do? I will pull 50 to 55 to ground levels and push this 56 to 60 to a higher level. How I can able to do it? How I can able to achieve it? By the help of certain threshold, some function. So in this case, I am using this modified uh, uh, that is called your sigmoid transfer function or set parameter that is equal to alpha. So I will use some constant multiple of 56 to 60 such that the value will go to a higher value and which are present between 50 to 55 with some other parameter so that it can go to the down value. So this is the whole concept that how we can able to achieve these uh, things. So now what is this uh, uh, modified efficient uh, net regressor is doing? Basically this modified efficient uh, regressor is computing your enhanced value that is equal to V0. How it will compute? It will compute based on the crossover point. 
that is equal to beta and where this beta is computed this beta is computed based on the modified sigmoid uh, transfer function or so now in this case we are using this modified efficient net regressor this efficient net regressor is constructed by the help of a efficient net B0 baseline network and replacing the classifier layer by the help of a regression layer. Then we are trained to predict the optimal crossover point from the given value of the value component that is equal to VI from the HSV image. Then output uh, from the regression layer is nothing but the optimal crossover point. So in this case, we are using the transfer learning concept uh, using uh, the image net weights employed during the training phase to reduce the training time and training data required to train the whole model. So, this is the modified efficient net regressor. As I already told, this is a last layer of this modified efficient net regressor is nothing but a regression layer, right? So, this uh, uh, regression layer will compute the crossover point that is equal to beta. So, now we, are, uh, we have to go for this training. So, here we are using a set of normalized value components extracted from the HSV color space represented by the macro images and the set of corresponding ideal values of the crossover point is the target for the training and the modified efficient regressor and the crossover point is the point as already I told this is uh, uh, computed by the help of a Orsu thresholding which produces a maximum dice similarity coefficient for a particular image from the enhanced image considered ideal value. So, how we can able to compute the dice similarity coefficient that is uh, computed by calculating your jacquard index that is equal to nothing but DAC between two images x and y can be represented by two jacquard index between x and y divided by 1 plus jacquard index of x and y. So, what is this x? This is nothing but the ground truth image and y is the segmented image by the help of this neural network or by the help of this model. So, this was experimented on 530 macro images. Basically, these 530 macro images have been taken for four different databases that is, University of Waterloo, MED Node database, ST260 database, and ST198 database. The detailed description about this database have been represented in these references. So, now out of these 530 macro images, 249, uh, 249 are melanoma images and 281 are uh, Neves lessons and we are using 480 number of images for training and 50 have been used for your testing. So, when we are performing the work of training, basically the number of images is increased into 4550 by using the augmentation technique and 50 images have been used for the testing purposes. This is uh, 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 already discussed that uh, augmentation is used to increase the number of images to a very high value. So, in this case, we are calculating the dice similarity coefficient. What is this dice similarity coefficient uh, or why this dice similarity coefficient is used? This dice similarity coefficient is used to calculate the crossover point and uh, for this also based method. So, in this case, uh, I have taken three images and the corresponding dice similarity coefficient as well as the crossover point have been represented for image 1, image 2 as well as the image 3. So, if we look into the tabular representation of these values of the test image 1, 2, as well as 3, the maximum dice similarity coefficient for image 1 is computed to be 0 0.88, whereas the ideal crossover point is found to be 0 0.494 and for image 2, this is 0 0.86 and ideal crossover point is 0.482 and for image 3, 0 0.89 and the crossover point is 0 0.282. So, this is for illustration purposes. So, in this case, we are setting the hyperparameters as mentioned in this table. So, image size is taken to be 224 cross 224 cross 1. The number of epochs have been considered to be 15. The learning rate has been taken to be 0 0.001, batch size 16 and the optimizer is the SGDM optimizer and the loss function that is used is called your squared loss error functions. What is this square loss? Why we are using this is, uh, squared error function? Basically, this loss function or the squared error loss function is computed by half i is equal to 1 to k ai hat minus pi hat whole square. What is this ai hat? This ai hat represents your ideal crossover point corresponding to the ith input image and pi hat is represent the predicted crossover point for the corresponding ith image. 
So that means we are calculating the two crossover point. One is called your ideal, another is called your predicted for k number of images. In this case, there is a uh, factor that is divided by two. Basically, this factor is used in loss function that minimizes the influence of squaring error. So, in this case, we are using the sum of the squared error. The reason behind is that it is very simple and easy to compute. It is, uh, uh, no, it is symmetric. That means whether you are computed ai hat minus pi or pi hat minus ai, that will give rise to the same value. So, that is the reason why you are using sum of the squared errors. The prediction accuracy of the model is computed by the RMAC, that is called your root mean square error. This is computed by 1 upon L, N is equal to 1 to L, Y N minus Y hat N whole square. So, what is this Y N? This Y N denotes the ideal crossover point and Y hat N represents your predicted crossover point and L is the number of images. So, uh, this is the, I am not going to discuss this. So, now if we look into the performance with augmentation and with augmentation of this model, then this with augmentation, this will give rise to the least RMAC that is equal to 0 0.078 and uh, the time per epoch for the training will become equal to 328 second. But without augmentation, the RMAC value is very high and time per epoch is 173. This is the visualization, uh, just type in it. So, this is the visualization of these results of this proposed method. So, in this case, I have taken the three images for visualization purpose. The first row represent the input value component, uh, sorry, input images. And uh, the second row represent the enhanced value component. And the third row basically represent the uh, crossover points. So, here is the result of comparison by the different methods available in the literature as well as the method which is proposed by this method. So, in this case, we have compared the uh, many methods like DS, FGLE, HE, CLEHE, JEM, CGM, SMRINAC, FIE, CBCE, LDR, MIRNET, IAT as well as the EMHT based method. This EMHT based method is the proposed method and if you look into the input image and the method output along with the EMHT based method, the EMHT based method performs the better output. Similarly, for this image too, also you can see the output is improved for the proposed method. And in case of your image 3, the output is also improved for the proposed method. So, this can be done by the help of your segmentation results. So, you can see the ground truth as well as the segmented output by the EMHT based method as well as the other method. Other method give rise to some outliers, some uh, uh, that is called your uh, some kind of uh, disturbances which are basically not able to identify the skin cancer, but EMST can able to identify the segmentation result properly. So, these are the some of the few of the results. This has been tabulated by the help of uh, the mean dice similarity coefficient. The EMST based method provides the highest dice similarity coefficient compared to the existing methods available in the literatures. And basically this existing method consists of the traditional based methods as well as the deep learning based methods of your segmentation. So, if we look into the summary of the work, basically in this case the EMST used for enhancing the contrast between the background as well as the lesion in case of your skin cancer. So, basically this has a provision for fixing the boundary that divides the pixel values into lesions as well as the background. So, there is a significant improvement by the help of this proposed method for this DSE that is called your dice similarity coefficient. The EMST can be incorporated as a pre-processing module in automated software tools used for dermatological macro images. And in this case, the 530 macro images that have been taken from the different databases, the ground truth has been computed by the help of Dr. Vipin Das, who is a dermatologist in Kerala. So, we have created these databases and made it available for the public domain for research purposes. So, this is all about this work that already we have published in a, one of the journal. You have a look into that and uh, try to use that code that is already present in our GitHub and uh, try to download that code, the databases and use your own method for enhancing the skin lesions from the skin cancer images that is nothing but your 
macro images. Macro images are the images which are taken by help of your own camera. That is called your mobile phone camera, not by a dermoscope, right? So this is the uh, whole uh, thing that we have achieved here. In next, we will talk about how we can able to localize the skin cancer for improving the segmentation. In one thing we have used, it's called your enhancement for improving segmentation. In another case, we are using localization for improving segmentation. Why we are going for this? Because ultimately, we have to increase the classification accuracy. And for that reason, we are using two pre-processing steps. One is called your enhancement, another is called your localization. Enhancement is done by the EMST network, efficient modified sigmoid transfer uh, neural network. And this localization is done by DTB network, that is uh, depth or that is called your deep threshold prediction model. So that is also uh, our work, which is already published in one of our uh, paper. So you can have a look into that. So this we can discuss after this launch period. Anybody has any doubt, any questions? Please have a discussion for two minutes. Yes, okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for instilling the valuable insights to our participants. Since running out of the time, doubt clarification session will happen after the lunch. I request all the external participants from other colleges to stay back here. Internal participants can go for the lunch. After the lunch, kindly return to the same venue promptly at 1.45 p.m. I repeat 